on the my bin directory, my 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 home folder on, on my personal machine. It's you know, 50 or 60 scripts that I've I've written over several years and make my daily life a little bit easier at work and at home. Uh, and then I have some closing comments to summarize the uh, the talk. So um, introductions, part one. So who am I? Uh, my name is Jason Franklin. I got my bachelor's degree in mathematics from UGA. I spent a year as a research assistant at Georgia Southern University working for a group of professors who were estimating levels of pollution at different locations and, and points in time across the uh, continental United States. Um, and they were using a tool called Apache Spark to do this. That was a really data intensive process. So we used the Apache Spark cluster to do this. And, and I wrote a lot of Python jobs for that cluster. Um, that was a lot of fun. Research is a lot of fun, but it doesn't pay very well. So I started working on the web team at the same university. I spent the last two and a half years working on uh, LAMP applications for the web team. Uh, and I say among other things because <clears throat> I did a lot of other stuff that was uh, sort of ancillary to that. And uh, I spent a lot of time um, just in all kinds of areas of, of, of um, development. I wrote a lot of, lot, of, uh, lot, of, lot of bash scripts during that time, uh, but mainly for my own personal use. I wasn't really required to do that in many cases. Uh, I'm co-maintainer of the nerd tree. My commits and my support of this project has kind of fallen off. If any of you uh, use Vim, you've probably used the nerd tree at some point, or you've tried the nerd tree. Um, it has something like 12,000 stars on GitHub. It was, um, I think, well, it was originally written by a guy named Martin Grenfell. And Martin's a really, he's a really intense guy. Uh, but he did kind of leave the project and, and um, just kind of stopped answering to, uh, answering GitHub issues or pull requests. I think at some point we ended up with around 300 issues just sort of sitting idle in a repository. And um, uh, a, a guy named Phil Runninger out of Ohio, um, really great guy, really easy to work with online. He has a very nice email demeanor. Um, and we, we whittled that down to around, I think, 30 issues now. So it's been kind of a triumph over the last couple of years. Many of them were noise. Many of them we could just close right away. It's, it's you didn't read the documentation or something like that. But um, there were quite a lot of bugs. Uh, and, and as you can imagine, VimScript being the language that it is, um, it took a lot of time to go from 300 issues down to, to less than 50 even. But um, my activity on that project has really waned as, as some professional commitments have kind of stepped up for me. Um, and I haven't really been able to focus on you know, editor plugins as much as I was. Um, I've put in, I've tried to become a C developer to an extent. Um, I, that's something that I've, I've, I've always been kind of interested in. And Vim being a very old project and runs on a very large old C code base. Um, I've submitted about 20, 20 I, I think actually 21 patches I've been accepted as either author or co-author on. And um, I have a 20-second patch that is under review right now. And then I have several others that I've, that are, that I've, I've uh, bugs that have been fixed because I reported things like seg faults and things like that um, that were just kind of defects in, in the VimScript language. Uh, and then given these things, you would think that I would talk about Vim or about uh, PHP or MySQL. Or maybe I would talk about Python or Apache Spark. But um, the thing is that I love Bash. And I, I enjoy using Bash. And I, I don't think there's been a day over the last three or four years that I haven't actually sat down the terminal and run some kind of command on a given day. Uh, I, I, just, I just enjoy it for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, I, it, it, I, I like how portable it is from different, different, um, uh, different, different Linux machines. I mean, with a few tweaks, you can take you know, a really useful script and run it on some other machine. Maybe you have to change a couple of flags here and there. But, Really, it's, 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 it's just nice that I have something that I feel like is going to be with me for the rest of my career, probably the next, you know, hopefully the next many, many years. Um, and if I can, you know, up like upload my brain into my, my laptop one day, you know, it'll be forever, um, you know, and some, something like that. So, no, but it, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really nice to be able to use, uh, use something that you know is going to last and is going to stay with you. So I want to talk about what, what this talk is not. Um, you know, now, now we're getting into discussing what this talk really is. Um, so it's, it's first, I, I want to point out that it's not about POSIX. I, I truly value the POSIX standard. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, what I was just talking about, about how I enjoyed that I could go from machine to machine and have some kind of familiar terminal environment, um, that's due in large part to the POSIX standard, right? If the, I didn't have the POSIX standard, I wouldn't have that benefit. Um, but um, I'm not really going to, to address that here. This is about bash. Um, and, and that's where, where I want it to go. 
Um, it's not really a how-to lesson. Uh, you'll hear me mention things, um, tools, or, or, or sort of ways I do things, and I won't really tell you how to install them or exactly how to use them. But uh, the barrier for me when I first started was just knowing what was possible and knowing what was out there. Um, and if, you, if you're not aware of, of some of the things you can use, then um, you, know, uh, you, you, you won't ever make use of them. And so I think sort of marketing some of the things that are useful is, is really beneficial. And it's not a list of um, bash tricks that will blow your mind. And there's, there's a lot of, of blog articles like that. And I think that's a great thing. Um, some of them are actually really good. There's one blog by a guy. Uh, it's called Zwischenzugs. And uh, which I think is actually the name of the blog comes from a chess tactic, but he has these really cool lists of bash tricks, and they're they're just really good. They're just really good, and I don't think I've ever read one without learning something. And it's not about testing your shell scripts. I think if I was going to talk about testing, if I tried to cover it here with everything else, it would be very poorly. Um, I would like to to do an entire talk on testing if I was going to talk about testing your shell scripts, but it is important. I don't I don't want to go through the talk without saying that it's not important and acknowledging how important it is. So this talk is a compass. Um, it's the talk that I kind of wish I had right from the beginning, and I think it, it would have saved me time. Um, it would have saved me time on writing my shell scripts and, and, and getting good at what I was doing. Um, this talk is meant to, to, to kind of orient you toward the, the, the methods that I think are proven methods of becoming an effective bash script author. Uh, I'm going to be kind of getting you by the shoulders and just sort of turning you in the right direction and just giving you a push, and at least what I think is the right direction. <clears throat> um, so the idea is that, that you have a problem, and this is the problem that I had, and it's the problem that everyone has in today's uh, world, is that sifting through all of that is a pain. And, and it's, it's a lot easier if you have, I would much rather have one really good resource than, than a thousand blog articles where most of it's repetition or noise, or in many cases just downright deception and bad, bad advice. Everything in life is easier when you know where to go. So let's get into the tools. Uh, the tools overview. The first uh, two things, and I, really these could be in one bullet point, um, is get and make. Um, you never want to forget a, a trick. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about one way to remember some command line tricks. But in terms of the, uh, you know, we're, we're programmers are one of the, the few people you, you can actually make sure you never forget a trick. You can keep everything backed up. You can keep everything in a remote repository. And um, as long as you don't forget that something like that is there, you can, you can use it uh, essentially forever. Uh, and the benefit of using these tools together, having your remote repository of scripts hosted on GitHub, and then having make, is that you can clone your repository of scripts down to any machine that you use, and then use your make file to install it really fast. And that's really what you want to do. Um, and then you can use your make file if you add scripts, and you go to another machine where you have them installed, you can fetch the updates, and then run make update, and your, your, new, your, your, uh, your bin directory reflects all the re most recent changes. So um, snippets, uh, this is something that's pretty important to me. I use, uh, 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 this is just a particular example. Uh, this guy, Surveyor on GitHub, this link here. Surveyor, if there was ever a 10, 10, 10x developer, it, it was him. He's unbelievable. He does all kind of, of great things. I think he works for Lyft now. But he wrote a really popular snippets plugin that was based on TextMate snippets features uh, for, um, for Vim. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that, um, although it doesn't really matter what editor you use. Um, you can use, most editors have some kind of snippets feature. But to me, uh, snippets are pretty important, and I'll, I'll explain more when we get to the demo of that. Uh, shell check is another tool that I'm going to demo, and I'm going to demo that, I think, in an, somewhat in, of an interesting way. Um, I'm going to uh, show you a, a script from the, Git, the actual Git repository. Um, so a, a script that comes, a tool that comes bundled with Git. Uh, when you download download everything, and you could probably run uh, run a locate command to find the script from your machine if Git, if uh, Git is installed on your machine, a late, later version that is. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, your prompt, the prompt that you use every day. I'm going to show you my prompt. Um, uh, the gentleman here made a point. Uh, it might be a little low contrast. Uh, I wish it was better, but it is. The, the colors are hard coded, so adjusting the color scheme doesn't affect my prompt. It's really meant for working on the dark background that I use on a day to day basis or on an eight color terminal that I'm, I'm remotely logged into or something. So, so it, it, it is kind of fixed, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. But um, hopefully you'll be able to make out what I, what I demonstrate. So like I said, Git and Mate really belong together on one, one uh, slide. Um, when you learn something cool, uh, never forget it. Um, automate the installation of your, of your scripts. And this repository here is actually one that I created specifically for this talk. Um, if you go there, the readme file, I don't really want to demo this, uh, but the readme file explains it all. And I wrote a, 
I think it's a pretty nice readme. Um, if you think there are things I should add, just submit an issue or a pull request, um, and we can discuss on GitHub. But basically, you can fork that repository and then start making your own commits to add your own scripts, and then use the make file that's there, and it'll tell you how the make file works. And the make file is also commented, so you know, know how it works, um, to, to actually uh, move from machine to machine with your scripts and take them with you. Um, so, yeah. So now I'm going to uh, demo the uh, snippets functionality in Vim. Okay, so um, the first thing is uh, I, have, I have a little script that just opens a uh, example uh, for me uh, that's actually set to the file type of a shell script. And then um, I can actually start typing away with things that, that, uh, that I would want to use, like if statements, case statements, or um, you know, until loops, while loops, whatever. Yes. That's a good point. Thank you. Yeah, it'd be a good place to put it in between. So that's an example if statement. And you can notice that I can tab through the different uh, points in, um, in, in the actual language construct. And so that would be an example case statement, which for me, for some reason, if I've spent a couple of weeks, I haven't written a shell script, I tend to forget the syntax. And tabbing through and then tabbing back with shift tab. There's also a menu if a language construct has multiple variants, like a for loop. So here there's, an, there's a, a for loop that actually steps through a list of items, like an arguments list, or steps through um, a, 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 a range of numbers, like you would see in, in like, uh, the C language, for example. And so those are your two for loops. So the idea for me is that the shell is, uh, has very tricky syntax. And it's actually very difficult to, um, uh, for me to, to remember sometimes exactly what the syntax is. But I always know what language construct I want to call up. Uh, I always know pr precisely what language construct I actually need when I'm writing a shell script. I need a case statement. Um, I need a, a snippet for option processing. Um, I have a nice snippet for that. Um, and I don't ever want to really remember precisely how all these things are done. I just want to recall and I want the editor to remember. And so that's really beneficial. Okay, so now we're going to demo Shell Check. Uh, Shell Check is actually a very, very nice tool. Um, the people who write this are just much, they're, they're very, they're, it's, I, th I think it's written in Haskell. And um, it's just, it, they, they've done a really good job, um, and they've taken a lot of time to put, put in a lot of um, uh, heuristics or things that, you know, identify portions of code that maybe, um, maybe, maybe are an error. Um, and I realize that that link is not very visible there. Um, I'm sorry. When you pull down the slides, you can just, the PDF of the slides, you can just click on it. But what that will take you to is uh, a script called git jump. And git jump is a, a tool that's it's written in, um, supposed to be POSIX compliant shell, um, we'll, we'll actually lint, we'll actually lint it with shell check here in a moment. Um, and basically, uh, it, what it does, I, I won't demo the functionality of the script because I actually need a, a git repository with a bunch of changes in it to demo it, but when you have a bunch of changes in a git repository, if you run git jump diff, it will load a list of locations of all of the diff hunks in your repository uh, into your editor using a special text format, um, lines of text, and then what happens is you can actually you know, sort of cycle through them with whatever editor functionality you have. Um, and it's, it's pretty agnostic, so you can, I think you can actually use it with, with several different types of editors. But um, by default, it, it does work with VI. So um, one way you can also find it, if you have git installed on your machine, you can run locate git-jump. And if you run locate git-jump and you have a later version of, of, of uh, git on your machine, it'll probably tell you where the script is, and you can just open it in your editor directly.
Okay, so I've opened the actual um, uh, script here, and you can see that there's actually a bar on the left side there that has opened up, and actually the first error is indicated right down, the, down there at the bottom of the left of the screen. Um, and that's actually not really, you know, if it, it would actually have two angle brackets with, and of course this script isn't actually technically broken, otherwise they would never have included it in the Git repository if it, if it didn't work at all. But these are warnings that, that shell check will, will give you. Okay, so um, if I actually position my cursor on this line, you can see the message at the bottom of the screen tells me that the type of command substitution that I'm using is legacy, and that I should be using a more modern form of command substitution. So here I'm using backticks, which are, have always been kind of, uh, I don't know, not very legible and a bit of a mess to me. But they work, so they still work. Um, but you're supposed to use uh, dollar sign parentheses, parentheses to substitute the output of a command and, and assign that to a variable. So I'll just fix that really quick. And so we can see um, that actually the indicator in the left column has disappeared. And so there's several diff different uh, um, other, w other ways to look through it. You can actually, in, in my particular environment, you can open a list of the locations of the errors. And so I can, I can jump through them like this. Now, uh, it's interesting, if you read this message here, the read command without dash r will mangle backslashes. So the read command is generally meant to read lines of text from, from the standard input, of a, or actually from the terminal window. So having the user actually type in a line of text. So if you don't include, um, so it's actually beneficial sometimes in that situation to have backslash n, say, for example, or backslash t mean a tab character or a new line character. Well, if I'm reading from a file, I don't want that to happen, I mean, not necessarily, but I have to be explicit about that. If I actually add the R option, it will read backslash n as backslash n, not as a new line. So people don't actually, you know, in this case, if you actually wanted, wanted it to read backslash n as a new line, you would just leave it as is. But uh, Shellcheck is saying, look, you need to be aware of that. And I believe in order to suppress these errors, Shellcheck has a functionality for something called directives that will let you actually suppress these errors. So I'll add the R option. And we can move on to our other ones. This one I won't fix because it's just an example of the one above, the two back ticks. But the next one's a little more interesting. The type command is actually uh, not POSIX shell compliant. The type command is a bash built-in. So shell, shell check has identified that even though this, is, this script is intended to be POSIX compliant, um, the uh, type command is actually, is actually used erroneously here. And we know it's supposed to be POSIX compliant because at the top of the script, as you can see from where my cursor is, uses bin sh instead of bin bash. And so now that we use bash, you can see that now all we have left is that other error. It fixes the error where the type command is used erroneously. Okay, so now I'll actually demo my prompt. Um, I wish my prompt code were in better shape because I'd be glad to share it with you, but it does have some, some problems. Um, I, would like to have, uh, I would like to have it improved in several ways before I actually make it public, but um, right now I will, I will uh, dip, demo how my prompt works. So I hope everyone can see it. Um, I really, I, I, as was pointed out, I really wish it did have better, better contrast, but Fortunately, I'm kind of stuck with this. Um, so as you can see, uh, JRF is my initials, um, and then I'm, my machine's name is Niles. Um, all my ThinkPads are named after characters from Frasier. And um, the directory that I'm in is bash demos. And notice that, that bash demos is just named, and that's because it's a Git repository. The display of directories in my prompt 
starts at a Git repository and goes down, unless I'm not in a Git repository. Then it goes from my home directory. And if I'm not in my home direct, if I'm not under my home directory, it will actually show me the absolute, or the, 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 the full path, the full path to, to where I am, to my current working directory. <clears throat> and so in bash demos, I also have an indicator, uh, master. So that tells me that I'm on the master branch of this Git repository. What's important about that is that anyone can actually add that to their prompt because there's a script called git prompt.sh that's included in the contrib directory, the same contrib directory in the git repository that git jump is included in. So the git jump script that we just linted, uh, you can actually you can actually go also look at git prompt.sh and you can add that to your prompt as well. And it will tell you also things like it has indicators for untracked files, it has indicators for um, newly newly added, or I guess untracked files, changed files, um, all kinds of things like that. It can even tell you how far behind you are of an upstream. Um, it can do all kinds of stuff. Some of that's a little, I'm not sure exactly, it's a little wonky, but I'm not, you know, it, some of it I actually don't use. But the main thing is just knowing that you're in a Git repository and you're on whatever branch you're on is really, really useful. Um, the two last indicators are the, um, uh, the job count, the background job count, and the, um, the actual exit status of the previous command. And I'll demo those now as well. And so you can see, it tells me there's a background job. I'm, I hope you can see. Uh, there's one background job running right now. Uh, so I just ran sleep 10, 10 seconds and put it in the background. False is a, ba is a bash built-in that just returns exit status of one. And having that is actually much more, more useful than really even the background jobs. Knowing the exit status is really important when you're testing scripts or debugging scripts or trying to figure out what went wrong. Um, I actually like that a lot. Uh, the one thing I did uh, omit just a second ago is that double arrow. The first arrow is actually special. So now I'm in a subshell. I've actually run bash and now I'm in a second level. So you can see that the magenta 2 right there indicates that I'm in a lower shell. And so now I actually can see how deep I am in the shells that I'm, I'm working with. And to me, this is really useful. I'm not sure. That's a good question. I'd like to test that. Yes. <laughs> I'd have to, I think I might have to install a screen. Oh, that's right. Sorry, I disabled the network on my machine before I started giving a talk. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, I don't want to disappoint, though. Um, let's see. Uh, so, basically, um, mm. Yeah, maybe we can try that later. Um, so uh, let's go back to here. Um, this is kind of a bonus. Uh, Vim is not really something I, I, I like to push on people because I know everyone has their own tools that they like to use, but Vim's really a big part of, of what I do um, and, and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of getting my work done for, for my employer and whatnot. Um, I'll show you a couple things that I think, though, that should belong in any editor that you write shell, shell scripts in. Um, if you give me one moment. So the first thing you want uh, to actually include in your editor is a man pager, a way to read documentation. And having the documentation right there uh, where you can just kind of pop it open and read it or maybe move it to another tab is pretty useful. I like that. 
I think, I think, I think most, a lot of different editors will allow you to do something like this. Um, and if you're doing something like Python, you definitely want to be able to read PyDoc in there or, or whatever. Um, PHP, same thing. In particular, when I'm working with shell scripts, I'll position my cursor on a command and hit the capital K button. And then it will open the man, uh, man page for Perl, for example, because I was positioned on the Perl, Perl command right there. The next thing I would say that you would want would be a terminal window, an embedded terminal window. Whoops. <laughs> I, I, I'd hope they would, had gotten rid of this feature. Um, so, uh, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I tried to talk them out of this. I don't know why. Um, but, yeah, it, it just kind of, it just really ruins everything. I, I don't, it's too helpful, you know, Any, anyway. Um, so, okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to part three, an example. And I'll try to give as much detail as possible about my ideas on each portion of the code. Um, I, I really, uh, um, I really, um, uh, I, I really do, do think this is a useful tool. Um, I've enjoyed using it. I've used it a lot at work and at home, uh, and it really makes things easier for me because it helps me recall little neat things that I've, I've come up with. Um, so this comic, I have to give attribution to the cheat um, repository because they actually post this from, from the XKCD, I believe. And um, uh, if you can't read it, um, we have two stick humans standing next to what's obviously a bomb in the first frame. Uh, and one of them says, Rob, you use Unix. Come quick. And then the next person, you know, next Rob has shown up and he's looking at the window and the window, the terminal window says, you know, to disarm the bomb, simply enter a valid tar command on your first try. Uh, <laughs> no Googling. You have 10 seconds. And then there's silence. And they say, Rob. And he says, I'm so sorry. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I've looked up how to use tar. I, I, I feel kind of embarrassed saying that because I'm sure some people who maybe they work with archives a lot or they do they're, they, some kind of package maintainer or something, they remember how to do it like you know, right away. I mean, I don't even think Debian, Debian packages use R. They don't even use tar. But I'm not even sure how similar the syntax is or the, 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 uh, the layout of the, the arguments or the options. But uh, it's actually, it's actually a kind of a interesting to create something. Now, cheat has gone above and beyond. Cheat is actually Python. Uh, written in Python, and uh, there's the link to the to the repository there. They have syntax highlighting. They have all these great things, but you know, uh, so so Cheat is very impressive, um, and uh, I think it's very popular too. It's like five or six thousand stars on GitHub, which is, as far as like a repository on GitHub, that's pretty popular. Um, so the repository for this example though is Bash Tip. Now I would call this script an intermediate level script. Um, I'm not even sure exactly how to how to rank scripts in sort of intermediate expert level or whatever. But um, I would say this is an intermediate level script. It's decent. Um, I, if you notice any de uh, deficiencies, um, you know, uh, uh, t talk to me after the talk. If you're less humane, just shout them out. <laughs> you know. Uh, but um, yeah. <laughs> so um, please let me know. Um, uh, there's one actual deficiency that I will mention to you myself that I've noticed um, that I would like to see. So first, let's let's actually demo the the functionality of the program. So the tip command is used to display reminders about how to um, how to work with your, your favorite commands. So for example, if you're running tip, uh, say say you want to you want to remember how you ran an rsync command, you would run tip rsync to see the tips you've saved. Oh. There we go. So those are tips that I've actually written reminders to my future self about how to run rsync. The other thing is that what you'll notice is that when the, um, when the output is too big for the screen, it actually pipes it into less so that I can scroll the output, which is really nice because I don't want, you know, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, I can go up or down. This one's actually just short enough that it doesn't really serve as a good example. One moment. So tip get is much longer. And there are flags to less that actually help with scrolling these tips. Uh, so for example, if I queue here, 
the, the flag that I passed actually leaves the tips on the screen, so I can actually continue editing the command. Yes? The idea would be to version your tip directory. So you version your tip directory on GitHub and, and leave it there and then just pull it down whenever you want it somewhere else. Um, if, you would, if, you can, if you want to add that in with like, uh, you know, maybe the, the process I described earlier, that'd be a good way to do it. Um, there's, there, I mean, there's little reason, unless you're including sensitive information, to not just make them public. Uh, the cheat, uh, a good place to start, is the cheat repository itself, because it comes with a bunch of default cheat, cheat sheets um, that are actually pretty good. So um, I've used those myself. That was my starting point when I first started, was to get those. That's a good question, though. Yeah. Um, any other questions for this? So um, how do we get the tips into, the, into, the, uh, uh, into our tip directory? So that's the, the, the help uh, option. And we run, you know, obviously it just tells us with, with normal usage, print tips on the usage of the given command. Use the E option to edit the name tip file. Okay, and with tip-e, I can actually edit the, um, uh, uh, edit the, com the, the tips for rsync or for any other one that I want. And when I save it, so for example, or a good example would be actually I don't have a tip file for tip itself. So by writing a new file, the tip is saved, um, and I can I can um, uh, you know you know save save my my examples. So now we can actually step into the code of the script. So um, the first the beginning um, would be uh, initialization, uh, and um, hopefully. Uh, I, I realize that this is a bit small. When I tested this last night, I arrived early to test, and I was in a smaller room, and it made much more sense there. So <laughs> I'm sorry. These are actually pictures from the GitHub repository. I took screenshots, just broke them up into sections. Um, I, I should have scaled this up a little bit better. But uh, the first thing is we actually check for the presence of the tip deer environment variable. And the tip deer environment variable, what you would do is create a directory with all your tips, and then export the tip deer environment variable with the name of that, uh, that directory inside of it, right? Export it to the environment so tip knows where to look for your tips. Um, and if that's not actually present in the environment, we echo the error message not configured with the prefix tip colon to indicate that it's, it's coming from the tip command and not, some, not from some other command that tip invokes. That's the reason you would include that. And it goes on the standard error, and we exit, we, we, we actually exit with status two. And the reason we exit with status two is because Conventionally, the way shell scripts will, will exit is they will exit with status 1 if they failed. But if it's a different status than 1, it's because you did something wrong. That's generally what happens. That's, that's the convention I've seen used all over the place. Uh, I don't think there are any hard and fast rules, especially if you put a comment in the manual page for your script or in the documentation that says this is how it actually works. Um, then then that's, uh, you know, that, that changes things. But that's, that's what we do there. Uh, we remove the trailing slash. So the tip deer, I mean, if, if, the, if the user added a trailing slash, we don't want that to bork any of the other commands. So, but we don't want the user to be bothered with, hey, you, a trailing slash. That's just something that would be really annoying to a user. So we remove the trailing slash. That's a special form of parameter, uh, uh, parameter expansion. You can read about parameter expansion in, in the bash manual page. It's well worth the read because there's a lot of nice tricks there. Um, so uh, edit equals zero is a global variable that indicates um, whether we're supposed to edit the tip or just print it. So pretty easy there. This is the usage function. So a minute ago you saw me use tip-h and printed that exact function. So tip-h just calls the usage function. And that just prints, it to, to prints, the, prints the help message to the standard output so you can read it. This is actually, I think, the most valuable um, slide in the slides that include the code from TIP. Um, this is actually the, uh, the, the option processing itself. 
And this is something that almost universally um, uh, shell scripts and, and many, many programs um, don't do uh, according to, they just vary a lot. I mean, think about the difference between the option processing for something like LS or PS. And I think there's like three different versions of option processing that you can use for, for, um, for PS. But um, like PS, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, there's, there's like, there's GNU style options, uh, BSD style options. Um, there's very little convention, and that's, that's really unfortunate. Um, and, and, um, but so many things depend on those little quirks that you can't really do without them anymore. Um, so what we use is a bash built-in called getOps. And getOps actually uh, is a very, very quirky command. And it's really worth learning. And it takes an afternoon to sit down. To me, it took me an afternoon. I'm just admitting that, I mean, it was slow process learning exactly how to do it. But I actually created a snippet using the tool that I, that I created earlier. So anytime I need to create a new shell script, um, I just invoke the get ops snippet, and something like this pops out, and I can just fill it in with whatever options I, I want. So I don't really have to worry about it anymore, because it is boilerplate, let's be honest. I don't need to remember that. So uh, the first line, while get ops, so what it does is if you have a dash, dash single ASCII letter, okay, it's going to take that as an option. And so while it can get another one of those on the command line, so it starts after the command tip, and then it just keeps getting getting them over and over and over again. And so it's going to, first that colon indicates that I'm going to handle errors myself. And then E is a valid option, and H is a valid option. If it's not in that set, E and H, or any other character I add there, it's going to put question mark in the variable opt. So in opt, if opt equals question mark, then I tell you there's an invalid option, and I exit. OK? Otherwise, I test opt if it's E. Or if it's H, I do whatever I'm going to do. If it's E, I set edit to 1, because now I'm going to edit the script. And if it's H, I call the usage function, and I immediately exit, because I know you needed help. I don't need to take any other action. So that's how that works. And then this, the shift command is another bash built in. And it will actually uh, remove all of the, all of the command line you know, units or, or tokens. It will remove all the command line tokens that I have processed so far. So all that will be left is non-option arguments. And that's an important distinction that you'll, you'll see made in scripts all over the place is option arguments and non-option arguments, options and non-option arguments. So now I want to process uh, non-option arguments, which would be the name of the tip file that I'm concerned with. Does anyone have any questions about this? This is the most confusing part of the, part of the script, probably. No? OK. Can, everyone, can, can most people see this? I'm so sorry if, if you cannot. OK, cool. The contrast is better on this one, <laughs> so yeah, uh, on this part. Um, so uh, now we're processing non-option arguments, which would be the name of the tip file. So uh, what I'm doing here is just some basic sanity error checking. Um, this is a case statement that looks at that special is, is dollar sign hash, and dollar sign hash is the number of arguments, in this case the number of remaining arguments, okay? So if it's zero, we say, look, there's an argument required. You haven't given me a command to deal with the tips about that command, OK? Um, if it's one, then I create the variable file with tip deer slash first argument. So if, it, if the first argument was rsync, now remember, first argument, we've shifted away all of our other arguments. So the first argument would now be the command. And so this file is now pointing to tip deer slash, and I remove the trailing slash, so we're good, with uh, rsync or tar or whatever, or tip itself, whatever you want. But if there's more arguments than that, then I tell the user too many arguments. If there's anything else other than one or zero, I say too many arguments, exit, you ran the command wrong. Exit status two. Here's the function edit tip. So edit tip does some error checking, and then it uses a special variable and does some magic. So um, there are, so, so the, first, the first part there. Um, Remember, we just set the variable file. If everything was good and we didn't exit the script, we just set the variable file. And so the variable file, if that file does not exist, OK? Yeah, if, um, yeah so um, if that file uh, exists, OK, then we're going to check if it's readable, if it's not readable or not writable. OK, let me, let me make sure I get, get the logic right. So um, we're going to check if the file exists. If the file exists, then check if it's not readable or not writable. Okay. If it's not readable or not writable, then I can't do anything with it. So I have to just tell you, can't edit the tip file, and then exit. Um, but you didn't necessarily run the command wrong. Okay, You didn't get the, the arguments wrong or the options wrong. 
Um, you're just trying to edit a file that you're not allowed to touch. So I exit with one. The command was run properly. Okay? So if file exists, check not readable or not writable, and then give the user an error message if that's the case. Otherwise, nothing happens in that, that outer if statement. And then we use the visual command. I mean, we, excuse me, we use the visual variable. Okay, so that special parameter substitution is the visual variable. Okay, and uh, if that is not set, I use vi. I default to vi, and then um, uh, open the file. But if you set the, the visual variable to say nano, or um, or uh, I think even get it would work would be fine if you're in if you're in the uh, the uh, GNOME desktop environment, uh, then um, this would this would all be good. So. Uh, so yes, yeah, so you can actually configure what editor you use with tip by setting the visual variable in your bash RC. And there's three, three variables. There's pager, visual, and editor. An editor would be your line editor, which in most cases would be ed, even though no one uses that. So this is the print tip function, okay? And so uh, it, it says, look, if the file does not exist, file not found. If the file is not readable, cannot read the tip file. Um, and here's a special, uh, we use command substitution, word count line, and get the, in, get, get the input from file. And then, so now we know how many lines are in the tip file. And then if the uh, tip lines are greater than or equal to the lines of your terminal window, and we use tput lines to get that, then um, we run less with the X flag so that when we leave less, all the text is still on the screen. Uh, and we use that, the, the input from file there. And then we, we output the file to the terminal with cat. Okay, and the last part of the script is to take action. If edit is one, we call edit tip, and the globals are set so that it can, it can take action from there. It knows what to do. Um, and then if edit was not one, we go down here, print tip, and exit. The last exit is not necessary, but I put it there just to be explicit. Okay, so um, I hope everyone saw something about my thought process in writing scripts. Um, if you're interested more in how that script works, uh, go to the repository, file an issue, or talk to me. I'm a pretty accessible guy, um, and I'd love to hear your feedback. So let's talk about um, learning materials. This is the shortest part of, of the talk, but I think it's the most valuable. So there's three things here. Um, one is the Unix programming environment, chapters one through five. I cannot describe how big of an impact that had on me. Um, I read that uh, about a year ago. Um, I reread the first five chapters. Everything after the first five chapters is about C programming uh, in Unix, but it's written in the 80s, and it hasn't even been updated. I don't even think they have a second edition. Um, it was written by Kernigan and Pike, um, the K from K and R, uh, and uh, Pike also from Golang. Um, it's really good. Uh, it's it's a page turner. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, it's it's as far as it's very short too. Only five chapters, maybe 100 pages. Um, out of the five chapters out of that book. But that will definitely give you a big, it'll give you an appreciation of the history because a lot of stuff in Shell, it's, it's, very, it's really confusing until you see why they did it a certain way. And, and the history there is, is really valuable because you say, wow, that's, that's why that is the way that is. You know, wh that's why that developed that way. The next thing is the bash fact. Um, it took me a surprisingly long to find this resource. Um, you actually, the only time I ever saw it linked to was when I went to the bash channel on Freenode. Um, and if you're a beginner, expect some abuse when you go to the Bash channel on Freenode. <laughs> but it's, I'm sure it's in good fun. Uh, but yeah, um, you go there. I, I don't know what possessed these guys to create this resource because it is so helpful. It's like 125 questions um, of just well-written prose about things that anyone would ask about Bash. Uh, I just cannot believe how good it is. And it's just, I, I mean, like I, I joke about the abuse you get on the Bash channel. These guys obviously have a lot of generosity. To, to put this together. The people who wrote this, they have a tremendous amount of generosity and probably have good hearts under, under the snark. Um, so, yeah, um, it really is unbelievable they were willing to do, do that much work. Uh, so the next thing would be man bash and, and, and help, the help command. The help command is a bash built-in that gives you information about other bash built-ins. Uh, and the man command, everyone knows that. But seriously, man bash is really good. Um, you can't read it all at once because it's very terse, very dense. Um, but if you if you encounter something new, please go read um, please go read uh, uh, th about that in the um, in the documentation and piece by piece you'll you'll read it all eventually. So closing comments. 
Um, so when I came here last year, I, I, had, a, I had a great time. And it, and it also, it was the first time I'd really come to like an, a, a conference where free software was kind of the focus. And so um, I left last year, and I was pretty committed to do things for, for free software. And so in my case, since I'm a developer, I've been writing patches for, for free software projects. And um, that's been really great. I've, I've, I've uh, helped solve some problems with some various things, um, many of them very small, pretty kind of in, insignificant. But the thing I just want to say is that if, you're, if this is your first time attending or anything, please uh, leave the talk or the conference with a resolve to do something for free software. Please, uh, if, you're a, if you're a programmer, help another programmer with a patch or something, fix a bug. Or uh, if you use a tool a lot, help document it. Help document how it works or report issues um, or help test issues. Um, and if you, if you, have, if you have, have the money and, and have the you know, kind of generous will, give some money to a, a really good project um, because they, they deserve it. Um, there's so many programmers out there, um, and they're just kind of burning themselves out working. Uh, and and it's, it's amazing how some of the stuff, it's just amazing what they're willing to do for free. I'm, I'm always amazed. I'm never, I'm never, I'm just like taken aback. I'm like, how, how could people do so much work for free? It's, it's unbelievable. <clears throat> and it also shows that it's very special. So I also have a, a quote, uh, some inspiration. So looking, looking at the blank terminal here, um, I want to read a quote that, that I, I think about when I think about the terminal. The future remains uncertain, and so it should, for it is the canvas upon which we paint our desires. Thus always the human condition faces a beautifully empty canvas. We possess only this moment in which to dedicate ourselves continuously to the sacred presence which we share and create. And that's all I have for the talk. If you have questions, I think we, I don't know if we have more time, but, but um, please let me know. Um, or, or you know, talk to me at some point in, in the conference. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. It's it is absolutely necessary. If you're going to publish anything, you have to document it. You have to. It's just it's just. I mean, you should if you if you care about its use. You need exactly. Thank you. Yes. Yes. <laughs>